Hello there. I'd like to continue my anime villain backstory from the signs from my childhood that I was autistic. Continue on from there and tell you about signs from my preteen years and teenage years or just just relate my experiences to you and um, trigger warning. There is some mention of bullying and some mild essay. So just please be aware if you're sensitive to that. Um, just be aware. So I was gonna do my teenage years video wearing some clothes from my teenage years that I still have and can still wear. Uh, but they're so uncomfortable, like the fabric that I, <laughs> And the jewelry is so uncomfortable for me. I couldn't do it. So I'm just uh, doing my Demon Slayer t-shirt in honor of my anime villain backstory. But yeah, my anime villain backstory is not as sad as the ones from Demon Slayer. It's only sad if you lived it. So, um, and I'll try to, you know, throw a few funny things in there too. So fifth grade. I um, moved to a different school that year. Lots of, it was a very pivotal year. I, um, my brothers went to college and moved, moved away. And my parents and I moved to a different town. I went to a different school. And so it was just in moving from the country to a subdivision. And it was a lot of change. A lot of change all at once and you know I didn't you know think about how much changed until recently and you know th putting into perspective like how much change can affect me as an autistic person <laughs> and no wonder that year just seemed like it really threw me off the rails I always, I always just blamed it on moving to a different school and that being the big cause of that. I always watched 321 Contact and so when I was eight, uh, yeah, when I was nine, maybe 10 years old, I watched the episode of 321 Contact about reproduction <laughs> on Christmas day because I was not missing 321 Contact. Not even for Christmas. If you didn't know what that is, it's a kid's science show that was on public television. So, uh, after watching it, I'm like, I need more information on this reproduction. <laughs> so I got out my encyclopedia and I looked up human reproduction and read all about it and learned all of the things by all of their technical names and... <laughs> had a very technical knowledge of human reproduction at nine years old. I was at this school and I had trouble making friends. So there was one girl that I was kind of friends with because we went to church together and she was kind of in with the group of little girls at school that was, you know, really, really cliquish. So I was talking to her and she said something that made me realize she had no idea where babies came from. And after confirming that, I thought it was my duty to educate her and inform her about, you know, tell the truth about how that happens. And so I gave her the Encyclopedia Britannica version of how that goes down. And she acted like I had told her the most disgusting, atrocious lie and that I was a horrible person because I told her and you know she turns all the little girls at school against me and they all shun me completely so I wasn't aware that tell you know, that that was a forbidden topic or anything like that and that it was not uh, a good idea to go <laughs> 
sharing that knowledge with someone else, I was just like, whoa, she is severely misinformed. I'm going to tell her. <laughs> so I didn't have any idea about the social repercussions of that and that it would have consequences in that way. Um, and, you know, looking back in hindsight, I should have left that, you know, combo to her parents to have with her, but I just like, it's science. She should know this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that basically got me completely cast out for that year because that happened early on. And so I was, um, at a new school with no friends and, uh, you know, during breaks, I would just stand in the hall and by my locker by myself. And, uh, I got to these, these boys came by to pick on me one day and I loved the wonder years and Debbie Gibson. And those were kind of my major interests at the time. The Wonder Years got me into like music from the 60s and 70s and kind of got me um, really into learning about that era and listening to the music from that period, time period and everything. I was just totally fascinated by it. And um, I had a picture of Kevin Arnold from The Wonder Years in my locker and Debbie Gibson because she was my Taylor Swift. I had to have like all the merchandise that all of her recordings and I heard like a sweatshirt and that electric youth perfume even though I could not stand to smell it it was awful like I don't like perfumes or I can't like they're a migraine trigger I can't stand them but I had to have it anyway <laughs> because her name was on it essentially so she was quite prominent in my locker and these boys decide to call me a lesbian because I have a poster of Debbie Gibson in my locker instead of like the other little girls who had new kids on the block and Corey Haim or what it, whoever was the, you know, major heartthrob of 1990. And so uh, I was like, what is that? And they said, you know, they were laughing because I didn't know what it was. Pfft, chances are they didn't really know either, but uh, they laughed at me and made fun of me. So... Um, I went home and I looked it up and I was like, they didn't cover that on three, two, one contact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that really applies, but, um, I didn't want to, you know, tell anyone that I was being picked on and, and shunned and ridiculed or anything like that. So I would just go home and cry every day. And when my parents asked what I was, what, what it was about, I would just say, I don't like it there. I'm like, I don't like it here. I want to move back. And I didn't give any reasons for why. So I just stuck it out that year and was miserable and had no friends and didn't know how to make friends. The drawing pictures didn't work anymore. <laughs> But um, I just got my way, though, eventually, and we moved back to my previous hometown. And so whenever we moved back to my hometown, oh, sorry, my refrigerator apparently decided to start its defrost cycle, and it's annoying me. But um, anyway, moved back to my hometown in sixth grade. And I had friends there before, and so they kind of welcomed me back. But people had formed little cliques during the time that I was gone. And um, it was, they were becoming more, you know, teenage, teenager-ish. <laughs> and so there wasn't quite the openness that I received as a, a younger child. So I quickly kind of got, you know, felt like an outsider there too. But I blamed it on missing out on a year of school there that I somehow just, just missed out on something essential that I, I needed to thrive in 
that environment. But um, I just wasn't on the same emotional level, I guess you could say, as the other kids. And, you know, I would go home every day, fifth and sixth grade, you know, I would what, go home every day and watch cartoons. I would watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and DuckTales and um, Animaniacs, things like that. And um, I wasn't too concerned with what was popular to them. I had my own likes and interests that were almost always very different from everyone else's. And since I had gotten into the wonder years and the 1960s and 70s and that music, my middle brother had left behind a bunch of music that he liked, like Led Zeppelin and uh, Pink Floyd and stuff like that. So I started listening to the music that he left behind and I just loved it and was listening to all of that. And then, you know, the girls at my school were listening to Amy Grant, uh, Seven Hills. And <laughs> so I was listening to my classic rock and stuff like that while they were listening to that. And the other brother, the one I tried to imitate uh, to keep myself out of trouble, he was into uh, Broadway musicals. <laughs> I listened to the Les Miserables soundtrack until I could probably perform the whole Broadway musical all by myself at some point in my life. So my interests musically were just not with everyone else. And I was still into the Wonder Years. It was my TV show, you know, that I really looked forward to every week with along with the cartoons. So I didn't have any kind of pop culture similarities with the other kids it seemed like and so I just found it really hard to relate and I liked reading books I liked big books <laughs> I cannot lie <laughs> so I, I like to read a lot and so um that was another thing my middle brother would bring home books that he had read for college and leave them so he left Jane Eyre and Desert Solitaire and um, oh, a couple of other just, you know, above my reading level type books. So I started reading the books that he left behind from his college literature classes. And so I would, I increased my vocabulary to the point where the other kids started ridiculing me about using big words. And, you know, it's not like I talked a lot anyway, but when I did speak, it wasn't, I didn't do it the right way. So, um, so I tried to, tried to dumb it down and that didn't work either. I just filled my sentences with things like, um, and, uh, and, you know, like those kinds of things, filler. So I should have just kept talking in big words. <laughs> but, you know, in a rural school in Alabama, um, I guess using big words does kind of get you picked on. <laughs> so um, I just didn't fit in, though. And I just remember girls noticing things about boys that I just, I wasn't there yet. And, uh... I remember a girl saying that some boy's butt looked good and I was like, ew, his butt, why are you looking at that? <laughs> because in my little brain back then, I w I'm just like, that. that's a poop factory, that's all that is. <laughs> and so while the girls were starting to see boys in a certain way, I was still, I wasn't there yet with either boys or girls, I was just like, I like faces and personalities and intellectual capacity. Uh, and I thought there was something wrong with me because I didn't really, you know, focus on the physical. So, you know, I tried to just copy people and 
be, agree with them, you know, when they would say stuff like, oh yeah, he's cute. Um, and he could be just a complete little butthole and, <laughs> and not likable at all. Just, oh yeah, he's yeah, cute little, little shit. <laughs> but uh, I would just try to fit in. So when I got into high school though, or at least seventh junior high school, um, boys started to take notice of me and that became, became a nightmare for me. Um, older boys would kind of, they didn't keep their hands to themselves. And at my school, seventh grade through, um, seven through 12 was all lumped in together when I went to seventh grade. And so there were much older boys um, interacting with very young girls and they wouldn't keep their filthy hands to themselves. And I would freeze. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't speak. I just, I didn't, I, it, it robbed me of my ability to speak up. And, uh, so I would just freeze and I couldn't, physically fight back and I just it was visible it was very evident that I didn't like it um you know you can I'm sure the fear was very visible and evident but since I didn't fight back and I wasn't telling these guys to f off and um I wasn't you know giving them a kick to the groin or anything <laughs> um and they were paying me attention that I didn't want. It drew the ire of some of the girls. And so the girls started, some of the girls started to bully me as well. The really persistent ones. And uh, th so where I had been able to escape into the girls' bathroom to get away from the boys, even though I feared that some of them just had you know, their boundaries seemed to be non-existent, so I would I'd be afraid they'd follow me in there. But uh, the girls would follow me in there and just keep bullying me into the bathroom and corner me in the bathroom and bully me. So I had no safe place to go. And uh, so I just started going in, like not socializing between classes and I would just go duck into the next class, like whatever class I had next, and just sit in there and read a book between classes. Usually there was like <laughs> a boy or two in there that was nerdy and got bullied and picked on too. So we would just sit in there and read our books and talk about our books and stuff until the class started. And that, that was actually way better than being out in the hallway socializing with the kids that didn't have any social problems. So uh, that was how it was for me. Life in uh, junior high school was that way for me, just basically ducking into the next class <laughs> to make it till the end of school. And I tried, I tried joining the band because I, I had no, I fit in nowhere. And so I thought the band might be the place to go because I liked music, but that, for someone who is sound sensitive, that was a nightmare. Listening to other kids learn how to play their instruments. <laughs> so the sensory stuff was a huge issue for me with band. Um, because it was, there was a lot of social stuff involved. We had band practice and stuff. And, you know, after, you know, after school and during the summer, and things like that, you know, going to different athletic events to play in the band. And it was just <laughs> sitting out in the cold at a football game. That was a problem for me. And um, being around all that noise and all of the socialization, and it was too much. So I dropped out of band because of most of, mostly because of those reasons. And I didn't really have anything else. Um, I played piano and had, you know, a piano teacher 
that was there, you know, on site at the school, but um, I just played a lot of piano and I sang and later on joined the chess club and those were my high school activities. And I, as soon as I could work, I had to work. I had so little time to myself during high school. I, I, my nerves were just constantly fried. And then I would get home and um, my boyfriend sometimes would tell stories about my mom. He says, is your mom Bobby Boucher's mom by any chance? Because <laughs> uh, she has quite a few of the same interesting similarities, like these similarities with Kathy Bates says Bobby Boucher's mom on the water boy. <laughs> I said, quite possibly because she did seem to think little girls are the devil if her treatment of me was any indication. But, uh, so she had some really strange notions like it's strange to me because I always loved science and was very logical and literal minded and um so if if something happened that she couldn't explain it was most likely demons <laughs> But, or if it was something good that happened that she couldn't explain, that then it was, you know, you know, a miracle from God. But, you know, there were a lot of things about my autism, since it was unknown, that she couldn't explain. And to her, they were bad things. So she started kind of thinking that maybe demon, demons were involved. <laughs> and um, I had to go talk to the preacher of the Baptist and Methodist Church. I guess she wanted to cover all of her bases. And, uh, of course, you know, they were like, there's an eternal battle for your soul. And I'm just like, I know I am not that freaking important in the whole grand schemes of things, scheme of things. Um, and later on, um, I really became aware of how I'm unimportant, but, uh, I was, I just was skeptical about the whole thing. And, um, because I would have panic attacks slash meltdowns. And, um, because I couldn't, like, I compare it to Siri on The Witcher when she, uh, does her, when it, the, the switch just flips and she does her scream thing where, you know, she, you know, causes earthquakes and you know, splits open the world and cracks open dimensions and space and time and all that. Um, and then she just, she can't control her power and it's just like a big scream until it's all over. And no, nobody and nothing can stop it. That's how it was when I would have a meltdown. It was involuntary like a seizure would be for, for uh, an epileptic person. I would just something would happen when, you know, that pressure would build up and it needed to release. And so one time I was, my dad was yelling at me about something and he's, I take after him. <laughs> I don't know when to stop talking and he doesn't either. And so he had made his point. He had reiterated his point and he was just hammering his point into my forehead, you know, nailing it into my forehead. And I'm just like, oh, you have said the same thing, like to me, 14 different ways. And I understood it the first time. And I, you know, indicated my understanding of it the, this whole time. And I get it. And so he kept say talking about it though. I don't even remember exactly what he was talking about that time, but he paused for, you know, a good minute. And I was like, okay, he's done. So I go to walk upstairs to my bedroom and I'm halfway up and I hear him running up behind me and he says, don't you walk away from me while I'm talking to you. And I just lost it. My, the switch flipped and I ran up the stairs screaming and my bathroom was the only safe space that I had because it was the one place in the house besides their bathroom that had a 
lock. And uh, so I run into the bathroom and I'm shutting the door and he sticks his arm in the door to grab me and I'm still just screaming and I'm shutting the door, not aware that there's an arm in the door. <laughs> I'm just trying to shut it and just against the door with all my weight screaming just like Siri from the Witcher and uh it just takes a minute to die down and so of course my mom had heard and she's like what's going on runs up there and uh sees what's happening and they I guess they decided that I should go to a doctor and went she took me to a doctor and slipped him a little note and uh, the doctor or, or slipped her a little note and the doctor wrote me a prescription for uh, antidepressants, Zoloft. And now they know that you should not give Zoloft to a teenager because their brain development isn't ready for Zoloft yet. <laughs> but they didn't know that back then. And so um, I was 17 on Zoloft and I was just like, if this will help me get through the next year, when I go off to college, I'm never coming back here and I don't won't have to worry about it again. And so I got on the Zoloft and it didn't do anything to change my mood. Uh, all it did was really intensify my stimming. I was, just obliterating my cuticles, chewing pencils to splinters, shredding pens into plastic chips, and um, my knee trotting was so intense that uh, I was sitting in the back seat of the car with my parents, and my dad thought that the car had developed a really weird shake because I was trotting my knee so much, and he didn't realize that, and he thought it was a mechanical issue with the car because the whole vehicle was shaking. And, um, you know, it probably other stems, it probably kicked those into overdrive as well. But, you know, I had probably, um, had probably had stems that I wasn't quite aware of at that time. I was probably going around playing with my hair <laughs> all the time, but, um, yeah, it really amplified that. But other than that, it didn't, uh, didn't change or improve or my mood or anything um and I don't I can't blame it on the sadness that I felt because uh just being a teenager and being unable to relate to anyone is sad in itself so I can't really blame blame that it probably didn't help though so um, I did have a boyfriend in high school from 10th grade through my first year of college. Um, and we, we were kind of on and off, but mostly, mostly on. Um, and he was different. Like he came from a different state and all the boys in my high school were wearing like t-shirts tucked into their Levi's with athletic shoes and a weird gold chain necklace with their football number or whatever on it and uh and he was like this long-haired kid with skateboard shoes and the whole grunge thing and listened to bands that I liked and uh like by that time I had gotten into Metallica and Tool and was starting down that path and so he listened to things that I liked and introduced me to a few more things and um so we had that music to connect over and um, different things like that. And uh, it, being both of us being sort of weird, he had way be a way better social um, understanding and was better able to no navigate social groups than I was, but... Um, I also dressed really weird. I liked <laughs> the 60s and 70s because of the Wonder Years big influence on me. And so I would raid thrift stores and buy all kinds of clothes from the 60s and 70s. Like, And sometimes I 
think back about that stuff and I'm like, man, some of those fabrics were so uncomfortable. The outfits were cute, but oh my gosh, how did I ever survive in, <laughs> in like polyester <laughs> that didn't breathe and I, I just, that just contributed to my discomfort, I know. But, um, you know, I, at least I had like one other friend who's still my friend now, but she was in a different grade. But that was it. And you couldn't pay me a billion dollars to go back and relive my high school years exactly as they were. And so um, that's just a big no thank you. So I guess uh, that, that I probably talked about that for long enough.